we let them come in and say. Okay, uh, good afternoon everybody. Welcome to today's special colloquium. Our speaker today is Lucas Goring from the Department of Physics and Mathematics at the Nottingham Trent University, the United Kingdom. So Lucas uh, is an expert in complex solids and complex liquids and in instabilities in multiphase flows. So his research looks at how the microscopic properties of these very complex, very heterogeneous materials, how they dictate the emergent properties at the mi mac macroscopic scale. He's also done a lot of phenomenal work on instabilities such as cracking, fractures, wrinkling. In fact, his book on desiccation cracks is a book that we uh, follow practically every day in the lab. It's a very, very important resource for us. He also uses these ideas in real life situations, such as in understanding patterns in polymer films, uh, 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 fossil biofilms, I don't know what that is. <laughs> then uh, reptile skin cracks, you know, reptile scales, uh, e mud cracks, that's very important. Uh, permafrost in Mars, and also in heritage science. So I was just looking up his website, and it says that his research focuses on why the universe is not so boring at all, which is, I think, what we all eventually try to do at the end of the day. So today he tell us that the salt polygons that are left behind after the drying of uh, salt lakes, why those are not boring at all. Lucas. Thank you. Yeah, so this is a picture here from uh, Death Valley. How many of you have actually seen a place like this? So they're common in uh, sort, of trop uh, sort of equatorial areas. I don't, I don't actually know of any in India itself. Okay. Okay. Because uh, the, uh, the ones I'm most familiar with are uh, in California. Uh, there's Salar de Uni, which I'll show you in a second, which is the, the world famous site because it looks so gorgeous in uh, Bolivia. Uh, they are along the coast of the Mediterranean and, uh, uh, other o and some other oceans. I've seen them in, in Namibia. There's some on the Red Sea. Uh, and the other main site, which uh, I've, they're apparently very beautiful, but I've not had a chance to visit, is in Iran, just outside Tehran. Uh, there's also some gorgeous ones uh, in uh, Kadim Basin in China, which people are studying as an analog for Mars. Uh, yeah, as I, as and Jeannie introduced, I've been fascinated by Mars for a long time, but I've never really been able to say anything terribly insightful about the place. But there is some po potentiality that there are uh, some fossil polygons from billions of years ago on uh, some of this on Mars. So yeah, so uh, much of the work here is done by others. So I've just sort of uh, provided the guidance and supervision and, so, and coaxing on some of the ideas. Jana Lasser, who has just been uh, accepted as an appointment of a professor in Graz, uh, did most of the hard work. Uh, she was a PhD student of mine, uh, my last student in Göttingen. And the original idea, some of the theory, was by Antoine Fouillet, who was my first postdoc in Göttingen. So you can already see this is starting to take about 10 years of development from starting the first idea to actually getting the paper published. Uh, and Marcel Ernst was an absolutely brilliant uh, master's student who got his name on two of the papers because of the, uh, just because of the contributions on the theoretical side that he did. Uh, he was a stunning master's student uh, with, working with me. Uh, and he's just finishing up his PhD in Göttingen as well. Uh, the field work, we, we teamed up with a lady from Southampton uh, who has been working on uh, uh, salt lakes and uh, geomorphology in terms of like sand dunes as well. So desert or geomorphology for a number of years. And the most recent simulations and theoretical side of stuff is in Leeds, and I, or I'm co-supervising Matthew Threadgold, who is just finishing his PhD on the 3D simulations of this. Publications have come out. There's field work. The experiment, the big paper, came out uh, last year. Uh, the, the theory paper, which was published two years ago, uh, is a massive undertaking in JFM, which came about because we kept we tried this paper in a couple of journals and they said well that's lovely but there's no established theory for this go away and, and publish a theory first so we published the longest paper I've ever written uh, 30 some odd pages long of theory and then we uh, went back and said can we can we publish this now uh, 
and we have an, uh, all our data is actually for this done open source. So all the data is published in a uh, uh, data description paper with a, accompanying data repositories. Uh, and so all the data that is behind this is available and that represents actually something from some of these sites which is already fairly unique. So yeah, so these are uh, patterns which have appear in dry salt lakes. So dry salt lakes are not necessarily that dry uh, and are not really less necessarily what you would associate with a lake. They look like this. This is Death Valley in California, which is the hottest place on Earth. Uh, in the summer times, it can get above 55 degrees Celsius there. It's not very pleasant. So we go in the winter times when it's comparable today, basically. Uh, or actually a little, potentially a little cooler, uh, high 20s. So what you see here is a, it's ringed by mountains, that's important. You see a dry salt lake, which is a crust of salt. The salt is about 10-ish centimeters thick, and it's overlying sediment, so sand. And this is, the mountains are important because this is a terminal valley. There's no, there's way for water to get in, but there's no way for water to get out. So any water that comes in over the centuries, millennia, geological time scales, carries any, dissol any dissolved salts or uh, sort of materials, minerals with it, those minerals will collect and uh, hang out at the bottom of that valley where that, water, where that water evaporates. So it rains on the mountains or there's runoff from the mountains. That water flows as groundwater beneath the ground and in the, the depressions of the valleys, it comes close enough to the surface to evaporate and it leaves behind the salt that it carried. And over thousands of years, that accumulates in these kinds of deposits. You can also form them in places, uh, so this is just Death Valley, a slightly different picture. You can also form them in places where that kind of natural precipitation happens uh, uh, along the coast. This is in Namibia. The, uh, the ones which are coastal phenomena are named after uh, an Arabic name, Sabka. Uh, and these happen in places where there's a lot of uh, deserts meet the coast and there's sand for kilometers inland, and again, the water from the sea collect, uh, percolates through the ground, and in depressions, it will, it will get close to the surface of the ground, close enough to be in capillary fringe contact, so close enough that it can evaporate efficiently from the surface, even if you can't see it. If you dig here, there'll be wet soil below. Uh, and uh, this is seawater, the salts from the seawater will collect. And this is actually a mat, this one here is man-made. It's made as a, as a salt seep, where after a, they will leave it alone for a few years and then go back, collect the salt and sell it. And you can see these salt polygons arising on the top of this mild depression, just next to the road along a highway in Namibia near the sea. Sorry, yeah? What is the size of these? So typically these are about two to three meters across. And that's actually gonna be important shortly because one of the defining features of these is that they are almost always the same size. So if we're thinking about scale selection, uh, the, one of the basic questions is what sets that scale? And this is one of the arguments that's, that goes against fracture because scale of fracture mechanics is that the spacing between cracks release stress and they release stress in a vicinity which is consistent or proportional to the depth of the crack. So it's a deeper crack it can, it's release, stress release can go further. So because these are always about two or three meters across, that means that if this was fractured, they would always have to have the same depth of fracture and they'd have to have a depth of fracture on the order of a, a half meter or deeper. And some of these sites, like this one, this is occurring in a slurry of sort of wet, uh, salty sa sand next to a, uh, the Dead Sea works where they actually mine salt out of, the de out of the Dead Sea. They have these massive salt pans, they evaporate, and the area near it is sort of a slurry of uh, mushy stuff. And out of, the, out of this mush, you see these ridges forming. There's nothing rigid enough there to crack. It's uh, a slimy paste in the soil, which is actually clay-rich soil. And there's a slurry of salt growing out of the top. So you get these in a variety of environments from a slurry which hasn't even quite solidified, which is only a few millimeters thick to the extreme case, which is the Salad de Uni. This is a high mountain lake. Uh, it's uh, probably the most picturesque version of this. This is the one everyone takes the pictures of. Uh, 
and it has these beautiful ridges on a layer of salt which is uh, tens of centimeters, like you can cut salt blocks out of it uh, thick, if not up to sort of a meter thick. So you have this massive layer of salt on top of which you have these decorations of these polygons. Uh, Salar de Iuni uh, is also, this is becoming more important because lithium is a scarce resource. This is the largest uh, supply of lithium in the world, apparently. It's also the inspiration for uh, sort of fantasy settings, uh, Star Wars, The Last Jedi. There's a sort of a 30 minute battle scene on the planet Krait at the end of this movie where they're flying over the Salar de Iuni, Salt Lakes. So this teaches us about our planet, but also extraterrestrial planets as well. Uh, another feature here, you can see when the planes touch down, they blow up this red dust. Uh, and that actually is somewhat realistic. Uh, because if you go to a place uh, like Owens Lake, this is the next valley over from Death Valley. This is where we did most of our field work, because getting permission to do any uh, sampling inside a national park in the States is requires a lot of paperwork. We, after months, we got permission to dig five holes 30 centimeters deep. That's it. Here, this is uh, something where we had full control over what we did. We had uh, people, local people there working with us. And this is actually an incredible site for experiments because it's managed. This was, all, as I'll talk about in about half an hour, this is a man-made natural disaster and Los Angeles is, has been actively trying to fix this setting up remediation, dozens of different remediation cells which have slightly different conditions with roads connecting them. So you basically have controlled experiments with variable conditions, all right accessible to you, and you can go there and they're willing to help you out with it. It's beautiful. The pictures don't look quite as gorgeous as the ones I've shown you, but the, the, uh, the main features are the same. You get these polygonal shapes uh, separated by ridges and the ridges are a few meters across. And here's where we get that idea of that red dust in the Star Wars movie, is uh, if you break open the surface, and this is true for most of the salt lakes, is there's water very close to the surface. In this case, it's about five to 10 centimeters deep. You'll find liquid water. So, and this is groundwater. So this is like if you dig at the beach, you dig down enough, you'll get water which, set, which percolates into the hole that you just dug. It's the same kind of phenomenon. It's groundwater, there's a groundwater table which is the level of the water that would uh, reach after you wait long enough to get to come into equilibrium. And that groundwater table here is about five centimeters below the surface. At Owens Lake, everywhere we went, it was within about a meter, a little less than a meter. So between 10 and 50 centimeters usually. So anyone have an idea what the red is? What's that red color? So what? No, but not a bad guess. Uh, in the Star Wars movie, they actually say that it's supposed to be uh, minerals underneath the surface, so not a bad guess. Uh, they're wrong, though. Uh, so anyone else? Algae. Algae, exactly. So this is an extreme environment, and this is, again, why potentially the idea of fossils, fossilized features like this appearing on Mars are of some interest, because this is an extreme environment. This is an environment where life uh, is still available on Earth. And algae and cyanobacteria are some of the earliest forms of life on Earth, and now they're confined to extreme environments. So that red stuff lives in brine, and that brine has 26% by mass salt. If you put them in clean water, they would uh, uh, pop by osmotic uh, sort of suction. They would absorb enough water and explode. And yeah, they're, it's full of algae. They are uh, eukaryotes in this case. They've got two little flagella and they swim around like crazy in that without very much competition. So but that's why uh, there's sort of this red color associated with the subsurface here. Okay, so the main idea is sort of this general pretty picture background is on Earth, these things have some fairly universal properties. And what we've learned from looking at them at, the, um, at different areas of the planet is that they're always a border a meter. They're a few meters across. Uh, so there's one from Owens Lake. There's one from, I guess these are both Owens Lake, Death Valley. But all the ones I showed you, the scale is one to a few meters across. And they're bounded by these little ridges. The ridges are typically a few centimeters high. And the dynamics are surprisingly fast for geology. These polygons will grow and change over months. 
So that's why you can use them, for example, as, or as they appear in these salt seeps where someone has just you know, used a backhoe to dig, dig a little depression, left it for a few years, and you get the salt creeping out. So they grow fast. And the idea that, we ha that I'm going to spend the rest of the lecture sort of discussing is that these are the surface expression of what's happening under the ground. So I said that the ground is wet, and in order to, to maintain these kinds of patterns, to maintain them against erosion and degradation, you actually have to have active transport to the, to the, to the crust. That's known. You have to have a capillary fringe, which mean, means that there is water which is in effective contact with the surface so that it can evaporate, even if the water table is a few tens of centimeters below, uh, suction through the little capillary uh, bridges of, of the soil means that the water can efficiently reach the surface and evaporate. So that, that water is necessary to maintain these features. And our argument is that, well, that water is important for setting up, the templating the pattern as well. And the main idea is quite straightforward, is that heavy things want to sink, light things want to go up. The groundwater percolating from the nearby hills contains small amounts of dissolved minerals, so it's reasonably fresh, reasonably clean. The water in contact with the salt crust at the surface, because it's going to be in equilibrium with solid deposits of salt, is going to be something like uh, uh, saturated salt solutions. So it's going to be heavy. And it's going to have, for example, sodium chloride would have a density of 1.26 compared to 1 for water. So it's going to be heavy. So you have a situation of heavy stuff sitting over top of light stuff. And that's unstable. And what happens is you get uh, convection happening in the soil beneath. And that convection sets up gradients, uh, uneven gradients of salt concentrations, which sets up uneven gradients of salt fluxes. And that differences in salt flux into the surface produces the pattern. And that we're going to explore the ideas of that over the next 40 or so minutes. And this is a particular class of convection, so it's called porous media convection. So it's convection within the soil, so it's not, inside, it's not sort of inside a big bucket of liquid, as you might have as a Rayleigh-Bernard convection, but it's within the pore spaces, so it's a slightly modified version of that. Yes? Are you also going to tell us what sets the scale of the height of the ridges? The height, no, because uh, that's probably going to be, so that's going to be something which, where you'll have competition between windblown erosion as well as uh, the subsurface phenomena. So that'll probably be an equilibrium of uplift rate, and when something gets higher up, uh, it will erode faster. That's, but I that's think actually it's more... going down, but it's not quite coming up, right? Yeah, so we'll get to that uh, as well. Uh, that part I will get to, but, uh, uh, but we need to actually go a little bit into the maths before we can actually describe why that, why that process of faster salt deposits it's a little bit counterintuitive. You get more salt deposited over the downwellings than you do over the upwellings. That's that, and that happens, has to do with the fact that salt is transported advectively, but also diffusively. So we'll get to that over the next half hour or so. Now, nicely enough, there has been quite a lot of work done on buoyancy-driven convection in porous media over the last 20 or so years. Uh, and the reason for that is because the same phenomena happens in CO2 convection or CO2 geosequestration. So this is an idea where you, 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 burn, you suck oil out of the ground, you burn it, you collect the CO2 that is coming off of that process, you liquefy it, you compress it so it's a supercritical liquid, you pump it back down into the reservoir where, where the oil came from uh, or a nearby water-rich reservoir, and... CO, supercritical CO2 is lighter than water, but it is miscible in water. So it will form a pool of CO2 on top of the water, and they will mix, and, but, and the mixture is heavier than both. So you have a mass transport into the water layer, and that mass transport makes a heavy uh, CO2-rich fluid at the top of the reservoir. And that problem has been studied to death over the last 20 years because of the massive potential of CO2 sequestration as a means of siphoning off some of the CO2 that we'd otherwise release from the atmosphere. So we can use that literature as a sort of help of some of the uh, background physics here. The, p the work we actually rely on a lot more is a very obscure, unique little paper by Wooding in the 1960s, where he was studying the case of geysers. Uh, 
where he has a, a, uh, hot, a uh, cool layer of water sitting on top of a hot layer of uprising fluid. And that interface produces uh, something again, something cold and heavy lying on top of something warm and hot. And convection arises from that. So the underlying maths actually was started in a very different context, but the same maths apply here. The idea is that we have a mass and uh, force balance or momentum balance. And the mass balance is the first two terms. You have an incompressibility condition on the water phase. So the water basically is, uh, for any of the pressures or conditions we have here, you just have an incompressibility condition. That's a mass balance. There's no water added or subtracted except on the boundaries. And the salt balance is two-phased or twofold. You have an advection term, which says if I have a, a, uh, a block of water which contains a certain amount of salt and that water moves, the salt moves with it. So you have an advective term. That makes sense intuitively. You have another term, which is the diffusion of salt. So if you have a gradient in salt from a uh, high, high concentration place to a low concentration place, there will be diffusion along that gradient. So it's a deduction diffusion problem for the salt. That's mass balance. Momentum balance is Darcy flow, which, set, which is the fluid flow equations that are appropriate for porous media. And uh, that's derived sort of from Stokes flow. Basically, pressure gradient gives rise to a fluid flux. And the resistance terms in there are in the fluid viscosity and something characterizing the resistance of the porous medium, the drag of the porous medium, the drag of the grains of sand within there to flow. So there's a uh, permeability and a viscosity which form the, the uh, resistance. And there's an additional term in there, which is a driving force because heavy things want to sink. So heavy things contribute to the pressure. For those who do fluid dynamics, this is basically doing the Boussinesque approximation. Yep. The wind which is only fluid, See, the, uh, that wooding and all started. Yep. So there, what was the, like, uh, what they did uh, for this momentum balance? Because it's also Darcy flow, so it's in a porous medium. Oh, I see. So it literally is the same equations, except that the salinity is turned into temperature and uh, uh, the density, so the density contrast is, or it turns into a density contrast, so it's thermal expansivity times the, the temperature change. Uh, so, or yeah, um, it goes into the momentum balance there. Okay. So if you are considering this, uh, this convection in pure fluidic medium, then last equation will, I mean, has to no, be No, so that's the, that's the equation which is specific to a porous medium, oh. yes. Okay. And it's called Darcy flow, it's been established since the early mid 19th century. Uh, mm -hmm. So, yeah. Okay. Thanks. And that's the fluid, that's the fluid equ dynamical equation for inside a porous medium. Okay. So, you, there's a lot of parameters in here. There's a diffusion constant, there's the porosity of the porous medium, there is the resistance to flow, viscosity and permeability, there's a gravity term. So there's a lot of parameters in there. We want to do this in dimensionless coordinates. We want to find a, a reduced set of variables that allows us to describe that problem. To do that, we need a characteristic length scale and a characteristic velocity scale. And we'll use that to non-dimensionalize the problem. That turns out to be quite straightforward because there is a, a nice one-dimensional solution to these equations. So if you're evaporating from the surface, you have a mass flux out of the surface at a constant rate E. That can be expressed as volume per unit surface area per unit time, which is meters per second. That's a, that's a speed, and that's the speed at which the fluid has to move up to balance the evaporation from the surface. So there is a characteristic speed, which is set by the evaporation rate. That's the only real sort of uh, scale of speed that makes sense in this case. There's also a nice balance between, in this one dimensional sort of, uh, uh, there's only one uh, stable solution in the 1D equation, so reducing that from full three-dimensional space to only up and down, which is a balance between the upwards advection of fluid and the downwards diffusion of fluid because you have a high concentration fluid sitting over the uh, top of a low concentration fluid. There'll be diffusion back down that gradient and the balance between advection upwards and diffusion which spreads out what would otherwise be a sharp uh, step function at the surface will give rise to an exponential decay of uh, the concentration with depth. 
There's a length scale of that, which is a balance between the diffusion constant and the speed. So that gives rise to a natural length scale. It's scaled by the porosity just because of the way the porous, the, that enters the porous media equations. If you non-dimensionalize by using these variables, you get a simple set of equations where there is only one variable or one parameter left. And that parameter is a, a Reynolds number. And that parameter allows you to couple the salinity, which represents heavier density material, and the, the fluid's velocity. So it allows the salinity, grade, the salinity to drive a, a, a change in velocity. That, rel that Rayleigh number, basically, the way I tend to think of it, it's a ratio of two uh, uh, velocity scales. So in a porous medium, if you have a blob of heavy fluid of large size, large enough size, sufficiently big, uh, surrounded by less dense fluid, it's the speed at which that blob would settle under its own weight. So it tells us about how fast things move down, and the evaporation rate tells us about how fast stuff has to move up to balance evaporation. So this is a balance of, of how fast heavy stuff will descend to the background flow upwards. So it tells us about how vigorous, how fast things should happen. So high Rayleigh number means that there should be more driving force, faster d dynamics, and so on. There was a question. Yeah, that length scale you have constructed, uh, so that depends on the parameters like porosity, diffusion coefficient, yep. et cetera, right? So is it always in the scale of one to two meters or something? That's where the magic starts to occur, exactly. Okay. So this is diffusion of salts. And I think that's more or less one or two slides along. But yeah, this is diffusion of salts. And uh, diffusion constant of salts in water are more or less the same. They vary by a factor of two or three. It doesn't really matter which salt you take. The evaporation rate of these geological uh, formations turns out to be quite well constrained between about 0.1 and 1 millimeters per, per day. Uh, and that's because the salt forms a sort of natural barrier or crust, and evaporation at generally ha is well constrained within that window because of that. Uh, and uh, the porosity of the material, it's just sort of a granular medium, so it doesn't, that doesn't vary much either. So this, if you take the ratios of 10 to the minus 9 or so for diffusion constant of salt, that's about the same as a millimeter per day, is about a nanometer uh, a second, which is about the same order of magnitude. The scales cancel out, and you come up with something which is about a meter. We'll do the calculations with real geological parameters in 20 minutes. So the steady state in this case is, it can be shown that above a Rayleigh number of about 15, the steady state is unstable and convection should develop. And if you do the calculations from these values taken from the field, which all of this can be measured, and many of them have been, and the measurements which were missing we filled in, you find that you get Rayleigh numbers between 100 or about, typically about 10,000, 100,000 is the biggest number we got. So convection is expected under these conditions. And so we have some, a system which should describe the porous media flow beneath the ground, and we have the expectation that convection should occur. And we also have a fairly straightforward system which we can do, which we can put into a numerical simulation. And if you start that with the sort of uh, steady, the, the fixed point solution of a sort of exponentially decaying boundary layer, salt rich boundary layer, and you wait a little bit of time, so A, B, C, D, E is waiting for a longer time you find that there is a initial instability where you develop small plumes of heavy rich fluid that descend. Uh, as time goes on, those plumes begin to merge. There's a coarsening phenomena. And eventually, you end up with a small number of very large plumes which descend uh, as quite deep, hundreds of times deeper than the original boundary layer was. Uh, there's a few other features of this. You can see there's some secondary plumes which are developing. We'll, we'll see those more in a second. And uh, there is a thinning of that boundary layer uh, to something which is just slightly unstable. And the, so we can also then model the salinity flux into the surface. And this is where we need to look at the equations a little bit. So salinity flux includes an advective component and a diffusive component. So it, the water is evaporating at a constant rate everywhere. That's not one of our assumptions probably not quite true in the field because once these ridges form, 
local evaporation rate will be slightly different from the ridge-free areas. But that's to start with our, one of our assumptions. Yes? Yes. So the fumes that you form, do they show tip splitting or anything? Because Not really, no. They, they seem to actually uh, have a focusing effect. So the smaller features will, will be absorbed into them as they, as they descend. So there's an advective component which is saying, well, at the surface, you have a constant flux into the surface to balance evaporation. So there's a constant feeding of salinity or salt into the surface. But there's also a diffusive component. In the areas underneath of these uh, plumes, you have very little salinity gradient. And so the diffusive aspect is going to be low, whereas in the areas underneath of uh, sort of ridge-free area or uh, uh, plume-free area, there's going to be much stronger uh, concentration gradients there, which means that there's much stronger salinity gradients. In dimensionless terms, you can actually write this down as a salinity flux, which says that there's always a constant uh, uh, salinity transported into the surface, which is advective, and that's reduced by the amount of salinity that dissolves back to balance the sort of uh, gradients in con stress or salt concentration in the, sal in the porous media. So there's always a net downwards component drawn by the uh, salinity gradients, and there's always a net upward component driven by evaporation. And because those gradients are different in different places, that means that those gradients will allow you to, just to add more or less salt into the surface. So the way we describe this is with a salinity flux, which if that term is positive, it means you're adding, uh, you're enhancing the salt deposition into the surface. If that term is negative, it doesn't mean you're actually withdrawing salt from the surface, but it means that it, you're inhibiting growth, you're inhibiting salt into the salt transport into the surface. Uh, the actual conversion back into salt content requires a few more terms. It's a bit more technical, uh, but if it's positive, it's enhancing growth. If it's negative, it is inhibiting growth of the, of the surface crust. So at the top, we have the salinity flux. And on the bottom, we have the pattern of, of uh, what's happening below the ground. And what you can see is this is a simulation for Rayleigh number about 100. And you find these plumes. They're dynamic. You have the little plumes which merge in. And where you have these larger plume features, you have a positive salinity flux, which enhances the growth in a very narrow region above that feature. We can also do the same thing in 3D. And on this side, on the sides, we'll show the salinity flux on the sides of this box, or sorry, salinity, and on the top, we'll show the salinity flux on the top of the box. Initially, we will see a very small scale uh, instability develop, and that will coarsen over time into a, into a steady state, which chooses a particular length scale. There we are, so that's the initial instability. You see the initial plumes falling down. You'll see the plumes start to merge together. When, they get, when there is a large enough gap between plumes, you'll find an additional plume will develop. And in this case, you'll see the development of large polygons, which are relatively stable, and these sort of smaller wave-like or transitory features which, sc which scroll through the landscape there. So there are features which are stable over long periods of time, and there are features which are more transitory. And you get a polygonal network developing, and as I'll show shortly, the length scale of that comes out about the length scale that we see in the field. Uh, you're not quite done yet, but I think it goes to about five. And after a certain point, it becomes sort of dynamically self-similar. And you see these features which have narrow ridges of positive salinity flux where you should have increased growth of the surface features separated by flat areas where there is not much going on. So this is just sort of the idea of what happens in, in between. For early times, there's a well, there's a well describable instability. We can do uh, a particular branch of, of nonlinear dynamics on that, which says what is the most unstable mode, what's going to happen at early times if you perturb it, and the simulations and the theory where we can actually write down explicit theory for that match very well. If there's an initial length scale which is predicted, and the simulations agree with the predictions from, of that length scale. As the pattern develops past a sort of a, a, a small scale features, past what's known as a linear regime, you get these longer plumes developing and you get a sort of focusing of the salt transport onto those ridges. 
and those ridges then start to coarsen a little bit. The features, which are a little bit smaller, for example, get absorbed into their neighbors. And this process continues for a while until you are left with a narrow set of downwellings where there's a sort of balance between uh, neighbors consuming each other and the appearance of these new smaller plumes. And that balance set gives rise to a emergent length scale, which is on the order of a few meters across when you convert it to, to uh, real sizes. And it is stable. And what's remarkable is that it's stable for and uh, fairly consistent no matter what the driving force is, no matter what the Reynolds number is, <coughs> or sorry, Rayleigh number. So this is summary over time. In this case, a time of one represents a few weeks to months, depending exactly on how you convert that into field conditions. So as a first prediction, it sh shows dynamics should be occurring on the time scale well below a year, and that sh which is consistent with, the, with what we see in the field, that these features emerge after weeks or months. Yes, question. Yep. Um, so that's what we're trying to explore right now, uh, is these simulations are all on a finite depth domain. Uh, and because something is coming from down yeah. also, right? So we're, we're exploring that right now, but, and that's just a choice of our lower boundary condition, and that's part of the constraints of the numerical simulations. So these are done on domain of depth 10, because that's as much as at the time we could do computationally expensive. We are now trying to go to depths of about 100 or more to show that they're consistent. At the very least, for, the, for, the, for what we've done, we've double-checked and not selected results with depths of 10 and 20 to show independence of the depth of the predictions. So, but yeah, we're going, we know that there is some very subtle uh, features, dynamics going on as these patterns uh, interact diffusively as they descend. And that should be on the order of about one order of magnitude higher than the Rayleigh number which is very large. So that's a very hard question to ask, actually, for the simulations. Because in your natural systems, I mean, then yeah. what sets that depth, depth actually? Um, I mean, not much. For, for example, Owens Lake is known to have a very con continuous uh, stratigraphy and a water table which descends more or less unchanged for about a kilometer. Okay. So, and we're looking at dynamics within the first meter or two. Okay. So. In the natural systems, you could have, you could imagine the conditions where there's some underlying layer, which is you know, like a, uh, an impermeable layer, clays or, or basement rock. But the Owens Lake case, at the very least, we know that it's sediment all the way down, uh, so, and water-filled sediment all the way down. So it's not a bad approximation to have an infinitely deep lake. Yeah, I have a question. Uh, yep. There is a preferred uh, separation between these plumes, which yes, comes exactly. out of this. But I'm surprised that you don't get a regular pattern like in you know, many other convective. Uh, so you get s a close to regular pattern. It actually has a fair degree of disorder in it, but you get what is fairly close to a regular pattern. It doesn't. It doesn't settle into something like perfect hexagons, like uh, like uh, yeah, like Rayleigh Bernard. No. Uh, this seems to be the mature state. The mature steady state. We run simulations over long periods of time. For example, here, uh, this is a typical kind of uh, simulation run. We're looking at the wave number, inverse of wavelength, and that settles in over three independent, real or is that five independent realizations? Three independent realizations, I think. And beyond a certain time, there's just statistical fluctuations around that length scale. So we always find a wave number in terms of about wave number one, which is, you know, means that we've non-dimensionalized in a way that makes sense, or wavelength about two pi times that, um, which suggests a uh, length scale when you convert that, those numbers into the field of about a meter. And we can do this at different Rayleigh numbers. I didn't go into the details of this, but we can yes, actually make a um, prediction of... Yes, sorry, yes. just um, uh, continuation of the questions that were asked. Um, mm -hmm. But now in the time, I mean, so, so obviously this is a dynamical thing, it's settling into a steady state. The, this time scale that it settles into the steady state. Yep. Um, are all of these geological processes that you, I mean, all of the, you know, real life cases, mm -hmm. is there, a, I mean, that particular time scale is also going to be related to. Yeah, so to the this, field's the geology, and yeah. that, that varies also, between weeks and, and a month in a few months. I see, okay. So that's again another prediction of the model is that time scale should be 
between 10 and 100 days, basically. So that's, you can get a time scale out of these, uh, out of these dimensionless because, numbers uh, yeah. by uh, basically the ratio of the length scale and the velocity scale. So I it's see, diffusion okay. evaporation rate squared, basically. So in other words, I mean, it looks like when you've got this dynamical thing that the small structure kind of wipes out into mm -hmm. these medium-sized size structures. Mm -hmm. So somehow, um, and that's this, that's this one meter scale that you're talking about. Yeah. So on and also the time yeah. that yeah. it takes to do that. Is so one might imagine that, you know, that if you waited long enough, mm -hmm. that because it, it would just become bigger. <laughs> Because so it's this not is, this becoming is smaller, but it's becoming bigger. And but they settle in, as I said, to sort of dynamical steady state where the length scale it seems to be well defined. And if you look at that as a function of the driving force, this is where the sort of, this took us a lot of, of, of work to sort of understand. So this is a very complex image, but we've got the Rayleigh number, which is the driving force, the sort of speed of the downward welling convection to the upward welling uh, evaporation or drip evaporation driven flows versus the wave numbers. So this is the inverse of the wavelength of what kind of features you should expect to see. And what Wooding actually gave us is this curve here, the stability boundary. That's from the 1960 paper that says any features below here are stable, any features above there are unstable. So at the critical point here, there's precisely one wave number, which is just about 0.75. Uh, yeah, point. there's the wave number which is unstable at that critical point. What we were able to do calculate uh, analytically is uh, that dashed line there, which is the most unstable mode. So that, if, that means that any particular driving conditions, any particular Rayleigh number, we can calculate what wavelength or what wave number is the first features which sh you should see. And that's calculating basically this very early time behavior here, the features that you should see arising from those initial conditions. And then we, map, we say, do our simulations match that? And the two and 3D simulations do if we measure them very early enough in the behavior. The sort of uh, magic of this is that once you wait long enough, these values, if you calculate the wave number in two different ways, you can either calculate the average wave number uh, or you can calculate a mode. And I can, I'll show you in a second why that matters because at any moment in time, there are additional smaller scale features which move around. Those contribute to the average wave number, making the, making the features look like you have small scale details. If you average over time, it's equivalent to picking out the dominant mode or the dominant features. So this is averaged over long periods of time. And that shows that the larger polygonal features are stable over time. And those are the ones that you want to pick out because those are the ones that contribute to uh, accumulation slowly over time of those polygonal features on the surface. So, so from this, so this dot, dotted line is from some linear stability analysis? So the, the, the dashed line is a linear stability analysis, exactly. Okay. Can you also extract the time scale to reach saturation from that? Uh, yeah, it's a border one uh, in the okay. dimensionless times, yes. Uh, that, that's actually an easy enough calculation to do. That's almost back of the envelope, that one. Uh, yeah, so, the, so the dominant mode becomes very insensitive to Rayleigh number, which means it's very insensitive to the driving conditions, which means that you can have lakes ranging from uh, 100 to 1,000 to more in terms of their driving conditions, Rayleigh number, which have, should have the same features. So that's one of the predictions of this model is that you should get a ro very robust length scale coming out of that. So we'll now sort of expend the last few minutes, 15 minutes here exploring some of those predictions and how we can map those to the real world and how we can measure that kind of features in the real world. So the idea of the simulations is that these phenomena predicts that there should be a narrow network, a network of narrow plumes surrounded by larger upwelling areas. Salinity flux into the surface is focused on those plumes and uh, the downwelling, you should also see downwelling plumes then underneath of the ridges. So also, as I will show you in a second, we actually went to the field we dug holes in the ground, we characterized the salinity content of that, and we found evidence consistent with that. So we have field observations of salinity uh, below the ground where we have salinity rich fluid lying underneath of the ridges. I'll show you how we got those measurements over the next 15 minutes. There are other predictions when that the uh, mature patterns should have these sort of stronger, feature, uh, stronger features which are, which are dominant along the ridges, but there's also these secondary 
transitory features which should which are seen in the models uh, but are sort of fairly weak and moving through the system. In the real world, we actually see features which are reminiscent of that. So you get the large ridges around the edges, but very often you'll see smaller features inside the polygons. Or on the top, what we have are surface height profile measurements taken from the field. And you'll see very often smaller features within the polygons themselves, which seem to be sort of secondary features. So there's some sort of a qualitative agreement that the dynamics and the structures are not too dissimilar, even if you go to the level of the smaller features. Again, a qualitative comparison, but one which is nonetheless rather rewarding. So one of the other things I tend to do with my group is move back and forth between re, uh, theory and, and experimental work. So the experiments inform the theory and how that's developed. And the theory, then we want to develop, the informs us how to design the experiments and field tests to confirm. So one of the experiments we did is try to do this in a Healy Shaw cell where we can see what's happening inside the soil. So here we have a water supply which is connected to an external reservoir of salinity about 4%, similar to seawater. We have a Healy Shaw cell about a centimeter wide filled with sand and it's evaporating from the surface. We're enhancing evaporation by the addition of heat lights and, and ventilation. We have a, a very coarse layer of sand at the bottom to equalize pressures. Uh, so that we have a sort of constant pressure boundary condition at, at the interface between the fine grain sand and the coarse grain sand. This is a slow process, but this is now something where uh, at a certain moment in time, after we've been running it for a week or so, there's a very faint line you can see there. We're going to inject a tiny puff of dye along a, a wire which is buried inside this experiment. And that's going to start to highlight what is already happening behind the scenes, but that we can't see because it's all transparent liquid. So this is porous media convection. It will look exactly like convection in a, in a real, in a sort of open fluid box to the untrained eye. But it always surprises me how, you know, it's also sped up enormously. One second here is one hour in real life. But if we inject that dye, pulse of dye, we have about three days worth of data to watch and we see convection uh, plumes descending from the surface as a result of that. And you can see they, they're moving laterally in a very similar way to the simulations. Now, in a mature state like this, you can also then take an experiment. This is one which has been dyed twice. The uh, dye which is yellow is moving up. The dye which is pink is moving down. Uh, and so you can see the downward moving plumes uh, and the upward moving plumes at the same time. And in this case, uh, we also dissected this experiment. We, we carefully dug out cu cubic centimeters of soil, of wet soil, and we measured the salt concentration in those cubic centimeters of soil. This is an insanely hard experiment or tedious experiment to do because it requires taking your salt out, weighing or taking your salty, uh, sandy, uh, wet material out, weighing it, uh, drying it out to see how much water was there, then weighing it again, washing it to get the salt out, drying it, weighing it again, drying out the, the salty liquid that you've washed out and weighing that, and then comparing all three measurements to make sure that you add up to the, what you started with to make sure you didn't lose anything and to do that every single data point on there. So each of these data points is one of those sort of multi-stage separation procedures. And the, what you can see is the, he, the liquid which is moving down, which is colored by the pink dye, also has a higher concentration of salt. So you can see this, this coupling between the salt concentration and the uh, motion. And we're gonna take that to the field. And this was also training us to make this similar kind of measurements in the field training us on the reproducibility and how do we actually do that kind of, of extracting a concentration from a uh, block of, of wet sand. So our main field site, as I said early on, is Owens Lake in California. This is uh, a man-made natural disaster because about 100 years ago, it was a normal, happy lake uh, in California. People, there was boating clubs on it and everything. And uh, then Los Angeles decided it was overly thirsty and it diverted the Owens River, which, ran, which was the only river feeding into this lake, into an aqueduct which continues to feed uh, Los Angeles. This created uh, the situation where the lake dried out and formed a evaporite pan where the salts deposited all on the surface of them. And this created a lot of dust. So uh, salts and the sort of, that sort of dust bowl phenomena in, in here spread these salts to the surrounding areas. And if you're farmers in the neighborhood, you don't want your lands getting giant plumes of, of salty dust uh, 
continuously blowing from the local lake. So they sued Los Angeles, they won, and uh, the court said, this is your problem, you have to fix the dust, and over the last 20 years, Los Angeles has put about a billion dollars into remediating this site to reduce the amount of dust formed from it. It's cheaper than putting the water back as well. Uh, so it tells you about the, the cost of water in a dry environment, probably not un, un, dissimilar to the environments here. Uh, so where water is a strategic resource. Uh, so it's a large lake, it's about uh, uh, 40 kilometers end to end, about 20 kilometers side to side, so you can see it's a massive lake. Uh, and uh, the remediation site is that gray area to the side, and that's divided into about 50 different remediation cells where there are different attempts to manage it in different ways, ranging from shallow flooding to growing reed beds on it, which are also good for shorebirds, uh, so they're also selling that as an environmental feature, to uh, putting uh, uh, sort of blocks of uh, rocks on top, all sorts of different things. But it means that we have a lot of different sites where we have slightly different conditions, including many which form these uh, shallow near-surface water features which uh, in, uh, allow salt polygons to form, allow these salt flats to form. So from the field, we can make estimates of all the parameters in the Rayleigh number. The permeability is a, is a factor of the grain size in the soils. The density contrast we can measure by extracting near-surface water and water at depth. The gravity is, of course, uh, little g, uh, about 10 uh, meters per second. Per second. But the porosity we can, we can estimate again from the pore size, just from the grain size distribution, viscosity is out of water, and the evaporation rate we take from uh, local measurements. This is again a well characterized site, so they know very well what the uh, groundwater evaporation rates are there, because this is the resource that they track actually there. You put those numbers together, you get these estimates for the Rayleigh number from 100 to about 10,000, and those are all should be convective. So at this site, we know there is surf near surface water. We dug holes, there's water within a few centimeters of the surface. We know it's salt rich. We know the water at depth is salt poor. And we know the Rayleigh number is, is of the nature that it should be convective. We can then also estimate the natural length scales here. So the diffusion constant is, uh, if you characterize the salts there, you can make a diffusion constant which represents all the, uh, all the salts present, just over one times 10 to the minus nine. Evaporation rate is about half a millimeter a day. And that gives rise to a natural length scale, which is that ratio of uh, induction to diffusion of about a quarter of a meter. There's probably a fine missing there. Uh, and if you look at the uh, prediction for the wavelengths, you find that that comes out, because there's this factor of two pi scaling, about 10 times that natural length scale. So it predicts that in these and the patterns here at Owens Lake, you should find polygons two to three meters across. We can then do surface laser scanning. So there's Joe with her TLS laser survey system. Time of flight, it bounces back. You can measure the distance to a point on the surface. You can use that to reconstruct a point cloud of the surface and do a three-dimensional surface scan. So we have this from of order 10 sites where we have all sorts of subsurface sampling as well as the surface profiles. Using that, we can then map on this diagram, which I just showed you, where we have uh, in the teal color, or sort of cyan colored here, the mode, the dominant wavelength from the model. We can then map on, uh, in, in terms of dimensionless quantities, we can map on the field observations from Badwater Basin, Suapan, which is in Botswana, uh, where Joe has done other field work, and uh, Owens Lake. It's three different sites, all with different salt chemistry. Uh, Badwater Basin is sulfate rich, oh, sorry, Owens Lake is sulfate rich, Badwater Basin is halite rich. This matters to the geomorphologists because there's a long debate about whether salts matter, the, the exact salts matter. They don't. Uh, and we find that these polygons always have a, domin a dominant wavelength of a few meters across, which matches over top of the predicted wavelengths and or wave numbers from the simulations. The last aspect is, as I said, we were training our, our, our sort of experimental hand in the lab, but we can also dig trenches, dig holes in the ground, and extract, just like you can dig a hole in the ground on, on near the beach, you can take out bits of the, of the uh, soil there, and we can sample that as along a cross-section across a polygon, and we can measure, for example, the average concentration of salt as a function of depth. We can find we have an exponential fit to that, which matches the emergent length, or which matches the length scale which we'd expect for the, that sort of exponential decay of salinity with depth. 
model predicts about a quarter of a meter. In the field, we have about 15 to 20 centimeters. So that's another prediction which makes sense. So we have a heavier, saltier water sitting on top of a cleaner, or geology terms, sweeter water. So the model predicts that we have this convection process going on in the ground, predicts that this convection is happening on the same length scale as the polygons, and it predicts that we should have high salinity plumes beneath those ridges. And so this is the last piece of the puzzle that we can put together in that we can actually then map out a uh, cross-section across a pair of ridges, and we can see where the salinity is or where the salt is. So these are maps of the salt concentration as a function of weight, sort of diagonally across one of these polygons, and sort of done by hand on top as the locations of the ridges. So we can see these heavy salt-rich plumes lie underneath of the ridges, and the, the lower salinity material lies in the pan in the middle. And uh, we can do statistical analysis of that to make sure that, that that is actually not just a trick of the eye. So we have the ability to check uh, that there, is actually there are actually plumes underneath of these regions. As I said, we also have this salt salinity flux into the surface. To convert that into a salt flux requires a little bit of calculations, which in the interest of time, and it's fairly just technical stuff, it's just a rescaling and shifting uh, to account for the background salt concentrations, it, we can, which we can measure everything. So this allows us to predict the salinity flux into the surface in these two cases. The ones where there are uh, underneath the ridges, where there's a low gradient, of, uh, a very weak gradient in the salinity or salt concentration, and the area beneath the center where there's a stronger concentration gradient, which means there'll be a more diffusive transport away from the surface, which means the salt transport into the surface will be weaker. We can characterize that these, these rates are about a factor of two different. So the center should grow half as fast as the, as the ridges. And we can convert those into measurements of uh, real, real speeds, real growth speeds, which are measurable on the order of a millimeter a month. So from the, uh, the, the simulation suggests that given these the distributions of salt under the ground, the ridges should grow twice as fast as the centers, and they should both grow on the order of a millimeter a month. So the last thing we did then is watch that process. And this is again where the, the local uh, uh, rangers helped quite a lot. So we left some cameras in the field. These took pictures every half hour. Uh, we left three cameras. Salt flats are an incredibly corrosive, destructive environment. Two of those cameras didn't survive. One, of those, one camera gave us enough results that we have a, about a three-month time-lapse movie of these salt polygons changing. And these are one picture taken near dawn every day, so they have similar lighting conditions. And so uh, you can see they start in March and they go up till about June. And you can see we start with the water table slightly flooding the surface. These sort of discolorations are water pooling, a little bit of water pooling on the surface. So this is what salt polygons look like when they're growing. The most dynamic aspects are down here. And I'll play this twice because it's uh, sort of you have to train yourself to see what to see what's going on here. So we don't have a, we didn't convert this into growth rates, but you can see that the growth rates are measurable on the scale of months. What Joanna has done as well is at Botswana, she's actually done her TLS laser imaging on the same site, one month and one year different, and has shown that growth rates are actually of the order of a millimeter per, per month. So uh, they're consistent with the, uh, the predictions of that as well. All right, summarize and conclude. What, we've, what I've walked you through is the argument that what you see in this landscape is a reflection of what's lying beneath the fluid dynamics that is invisible to the eye, but is lying underneath in the water table, which is just below the surface here, is coupled to and uh, uh, producing these patterns that you see on the surface. And what we're doing right now is extending that into 3D, but we've been careful to make sure that we keep a wide number of uh, predictions for that. We see that we have a similar emergent length scale as the polygons that form. We show that there's explicitly in the field that there are salt-rich uh, plumes happening underneath of the, of the ridges. And we can convert that into growth rates, which are comparable to 
uh, what's observed in the field. And we also have this idea that we have a very narrow network of ridges connecting uh, the, the features there. The theory work is published uh, in a JFM paper. The data, again, as I said at the beginning, it's a nice open source of the, of the geology experiments. And everything together was published about the middle of last year in a, a PRX paper. So that's the one to take a look at to get the overview. All right. Thank you very much. Uh, <coughs> do you understand the effective dynamics? Like, do you have a model for the effective dy dynamics for the surface? Uh, so uh, we basically have just sort of thought of it as, as a accumulation, so oh, accumulation over time. Yeah, uh, no, so I mean, if I just uh, suppose I don't want to look at the other dimension mm -hmm. and just I want to focus on the surface because it's a quite dynamic process, right? Like the last uh, movie you showed. Yep. And is there an effective model for the dyna uh That actually becomes quite a bit more challenging. So we, we, what we've been trying to do, and actually rather unsuccessfully at that, is uh, trying to get in something where we have yeah, um, a coupling between the evaporation. So we want basically, what we would love to do is, is in the models have a counter which tells us how much salt is going into the surface and use that to modulate the evaporation rate above it. That turns out to be actually quite challenging to do in a well-defined way. But in terms of dynamics of the structure here, um, what we've done so far is just measure the density of, of, of these things and say, well, we know how much, we can estimate how much salt is coming to the system. We can estimate a growth rate by converting mass by density and density into volume, volume rates of change. There are additional features. You can see here, these are actually thrusting up. So in the areas where it's growing faster, it can buckle upwards and you can have sort of what are called TP structures, which are hollow underneath. So you can, or you can have thrust ridges, which is actually closer to what uh, is seen in the simulation here, or in the movie here. Uh, down here, you'll have what's, what they call a thrust ridge. This will be thrusting as it grows upwards over top of the layer below. So at that point, there's quite a lot going on, and uh, it's a struggle to understand how to model that specifically. What we're showing is the groundwater should be delivering more salt to these particular locations, which is consistent with ridge growth being places where there's more salt. Yeah, okay. And more salt being added over time, so faster deposition. So this, uh, I mean, this ridges, they don't go, uh, go in that, uh, in the surface, they don't undergo diffusion. It's more than diffusion. It's, it? they don't move that much, no. Um, I mean, like in the, Time what, an, exper source. an experiment I would love to do is strip the, take some, take some images of the, of the crust, strip the crust off, and come back next year. Mm -hmm. That's a bit of a challenging experiment to do, though, but yeah, that would be the sort of obvious next step if we had a very large field budget, because that's not, that's not a non trivial experiment to do, uh, so without disturbing what's underneath as well. But that would be, a, that would be the obvious next step. Uh, yeah. yeah. I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so uh, initially, you said about the algae, uh, the, um, algae. Oh yeah, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, are you considering the dynamics of those algae uh, no. densities in the? No, no, no. Uh, we we study algae uh, in different contexts, but not here. No, these just live in. These happily live in the in the water there. They photosynthesize. No. They they like it. What I was thinking is that, is that they control the salinity of the, is, is it as, means uh, two-dimensional uh, two uh, uh, reaction diffusion equation where... Uh, no, they're not, they're not, there's no reaction term in here, so they're not actually, they photosynthesize, they, they just live in salt brine, so they don't actually produce any, any of that salt itself, they just live there. And they don't even control the diffusion coefficient of the... No. Nope. Uh, they can move, so presumably they, there'll be some sort of a chemotaxis, uh, which keeps them in, in sort of conditions that they're, that they're favorable to them. Uh, but yeah, they, they just pa they more passively live there. So. And another question, sir. So the, is it the model is similar to that of a tectonic plates? Means, uh, so the thrust ridges could potentially have some similarities to that, because you're, uh, but yeah, that's, that's going into the, that, that becomes more mechanics, uh, and that relies on the question of what actually are the constitutive relations of 
salt crusts, which is probably much more sensitive to the, to the salt con the type of salt as well. Um, there are, uh, one reason I vag vaguely mentioned in passing the presence of sulfates is sulfates arise in different hydration states, mirabolite to thenardite as a transition between an anhydrous to a hydrous phase, uh, and that causes that particular chemical to swell by three, or three times its volume when, it, when, it's, when the hydration state changes, which happens around room temperature. So at Owens Lake, there are actually day-night cycles where, you, where the, the salts change phase and release and absorb you know, three times their volume in water every day and night. So there are, there are some very subtle effects which are salt dependent on that. So that becomes a much more s specific problem than what we're trying to answer here. Thank you. So when you talk about the growth rate of the salt ridges, mm -hmm. do you also consider the withering rate or? So if you were to make a, a model of that, yes, that would be, so the first order estimation is that weathering depends on local curvature. So if, you, if you're eroding something, uh, you basically, the, the pointy regions get, get eroded down and stuff sort of falls down, downhill. So you could actually p make a model of erosion versus growth rates. Uh, that's been done for other systems like uh, some permafrost patterns uh, and it works decently as a first estimate. Uh, so that it's possible to, to do that. But again, you have these additional features of, of this thrusting and uh, breaking and sort of, uh, uh, sort of TP-like structures which would make that a bit of a subtle model to build. But yeah, there are models which, which can turn surface profiles into erosion rates, and then all you do is balance uplift and, and erosion rates, and you, you can develop that into sort of a steady state. Uh, it's possible, but again, the it turns into more of a mechanics problem, and one which is more specific to the local, exactly the, the way these, these shapes look, which as you can see, have slightly different morphologies in different places. And that would be enough to matter okay. at that level. So, uh, can I ask? Uh, yeah. yeah. So, your driving parameter seems to be the uh, Rayleigh number. Exactly. So, there, the in denominator, the evaporation rate is yep. uh, sitting there. Yep. So, uh, that means that if almost zero evaporation, your Rayleigh number will be very large. Yes. So what, what does physically mean then? Um, what that means is if you have a low evaporation rate, you have more time for diffusion to act, which means you, ha you actually build up a thicker boundary layer, which is therefore more, more mass, which contributes to uh, sort of the, that, that downwelling effect. So actually higher Rayleigh number means you would actually develop, it would be slow to mm. develop because it also enters a natural time scale, but you would develop over long periods of time uh, a very thick boundary layer just because you're having the Rayleigh numbers in, is balanced between advection and diffusion. Low advection means diffusion wins, means you have a thick boundary layer, which means you have a lot more mass present to drive convection. Okay. So that's why there's that, that inverse uh, relationship in that. Yeah. And also, uh, is, uh, so you, you neglected temperature. Temperature doesn't matter. Yeah, that's, so you can calculate the effects. Uh, that's actually one, every, every time we submit this, the referee asks exactly that question. Uh, you can calculate a point. The buoyancy term for the, de for the density changes in water due to salts is 26%. Mm. The density changes in the, uh, due to temperature are of the order of a tenth of a percent. Okay. Because, yeah, uh, uh, it's, n it's orders of magnitude smaller. Okay. So there is actually a phenomenon called double diffusive convection, uh, and that rel the whether that's important or not relies on the uh, uh, ratio of, of Rayleigh numbers due to thermal and solutal points uh, Rayleigh numbers, and that needs to be of order one for those double diffusive effects to be the case. It happens in the oceans. You get actually very similar conditions. Just replace you get a similar kind of Rayleigh number replacing Navier-Stokes with uh, Darcy flow with Navier-Stokes. And there, the solutal gradients are quite gradual. Uh, and then the temperature and salinity gradients are comparable. And you get a beautiful phenomenon called, uh, 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 double, or called double diffusive fingering, or salt fingers, uh, where you actually have interpenetrating layers of, of salt, salty rich, uh, but salty rich but warm water, and salt poor but uh, cold water interleaving with uh, sort of diffusive effects in between. It's a gorgeous phenomenon. 
Uh, but yeah, it's not actually related to this one. <laughs> yes. So uh, this uh, instability that you are getting at the starting point, is it, is it uh, really tail instability or is it something like that? Um, it's related, but uh, it's not quite that phenomenon. But they're, they, are, they are somewhat related, yes. Uh, it's cl the closest is really Bernard conduction, uh, but yeah. Uh, but in, you replace it with porous media flow, and you break the symmetry by the one, dire one directional flow, which means it's actually one, it's, uh, one sided convection. So in convection, you have the bottom boundary matters. In this case, we assume the bottom boundary is, is infinitely far away. And so it's a one-sided convection process. So there's some two subtle differences uh, in terms of, of yeah, the way you're driving it and the, the symmetry breaking there. But it's closest to really Bernard convection. And uh, this is also very interesting that when they go inside, I mean, when we travel inside, they are uh, joining together. They are so. Uh, but uh, why? Why that could be? The case? Uh, so that actually is re relatively easy to argue in terms of conservation of mass. So the material moves up here, only a little bit escapes from the surface, and it moves down here. So conservation of volume, mass, water, means that you have to have sideways flow uh, near the surface, which feeds the downwelling flows. So anything which is small near the surface will get caught up by that lateral motion, which is just conservation of mass. If you have stuff going up, it has a fixed ev evaporation at the surface, so it can't, it can't go past that. So more mass moving up must go to the side in order to balance mass moving down. And it just carries any smaller plumes with it. So Thank smaller you. plumes are carried away with a sort of, of this background flow. Uh, Thank and it's only if they get large enough to compete with that that they will have a chance of surviving. Um, so just a phenomenological question. Just understanding the, suppose we didn't know what was happening below mm -hmm. the surface or something, similar to what Sanjeev was saying. If you just phenomenologically look at this, uh, do you see, I mean, this is something that I, I'm not sure I fully understood in the dynamical picture. The walls that are appearing and disappearing, but the mm -hmm. location of the walls or whatever, these ridges, are they actually shifting around or they, do, do they remain the same? Meaning they, they yeah, so rise and fall and make bigger and smaller cells, mm -hmm. but do the actual... Um, so there's yeah. two things here. The, 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 the larger, uh, the, the deep plumes are relatively stable. They're actually more stable in 3D than they are in 2D. So this is something that confused us because we saw a lot of wiggle in the 2D simulations and we were worried about that. But they're actually more stable. So the large features here will not change much over time. It's the, smaller, it's the smaller features which represent these little plumes which get swept in, which will change over time. The other aspect of this is if you couple this to a variable evaporation rate on the surface, uh, then counterintuitively, what you actually happen is you get thicker ridges of salt which will impede evaporation more and we can measure the relative humidity and temperature uh, in, in the field of those sites uh, in, the, in the middle of a ridge and in the middle of a of, uh, polygon to show that evaporation rate should be consistent with that. You actually get slower evaporation over the ridges than you do in the middle. So, and we can, what we would love to do is have a coupling between a surface evaporation rate and the amount of salt that's accumulated in the model. We can't do that because that is a very hard problem to do numerically. But what we can do is we can modulate the surface evaporation rate. So if you put, a, if you put something like a sine wave in, you find, as predicted, that the plumes will fix under the positions where there's slower evaporation and stay there. Um, and so that suggests that once you start building up ridges, it will, there'll be a feedback which stabilizes the location of those ridges over time. And, and you see that phenomenologically as well? Yeah. Like, okay. And the, the reason this is interesting is also because it's like 2D random geometry, mm -hmm. which of course yeah. is of interest to people like me. Yep. But it's very, you know, so the question is what is the driving, so you have this three-dimensional picture, but at the surface it looks like there is some kind of an effective geometrical process that's happening. Yeah. So it'd be interesting to know if people so have looked on, at this. So on the level of topology, that's not something that we have actively pursued. Uh, we're working with a group 
uh, in Hungary who do this sort of on a more phenomenological basis. You can characterize uh, closed polygonal network shapes by um, the statistics of their junctions and numbers of neighbors and, and things like that. And this is actually one thing, we're, one area where we're working with them on the idea of evidence that similar looking features on Mars may be salt polygons because there's, there's a set of characteristic numbers that you can get out of that. Uh, and our simulations and the field work numbers come out to be very similar and the, the observations from Mars are, are, are on the comparable cluster. Whereas other phenomena like mud cracks or uh, hex kilometer joints lie elsewhere on this sort of configurational space. So someone, at, so there are, we're working with some people who are trying to do a phenomenological characterization of the topology, not necessarily writing down any rules or dynamics for it, but just saying, if this is what it looks like, here's how we can map it to something where there, there are metrics that allow you to distinguish it from other similar looking patterns. That's as far as we're getting on that aspect. Um. You want one last question. I was about to ask about alien worlds that you talked about. So in Mars, the observations you're mentioning is salt and water or some other materials? Um, it's fossils. Uh, so actually, since I just gave them a Mars talk in my last university I was at, um, the Marsan ones look a bit like, where are we? Like that. Uh, it, it's, they're basically, uh, yeah, blocky areas separated by gaps, uh, and the blocky areas look quite a bit like some of the features, it, but these would be fossilized from four billion years ago. Uh, and the question is, is there any evidence that we can distinguish the, you know, that phenomena in the fossil record on another planet from what's, you know, based on... Do we see something like that on Earth as well? Or? There are fossil features of salt polygons on Earth. Um, the only one I really know about is actually in the UK, and I keep meaning to go visit it. It's, it's in Cheshire, uh, but yeah, there's some salt polygons which are deep in the fossil record on, uh, near there. So th it's not like they're, they're, they are absent from the fossil record, uh, but they're not particularly common. So. Okay, I think there might be more questions, but we can take them downstairs. So we have uh, Haiti just behind the building. Uh, let's first thank uh, Lucas for a fan fantastic talk, and here's thank you a token much. of our appreciation. Thank you. So we can all head downstairs and ask more questions and have some high tea. Huh. And I'm around for the rest of the week as well for more uh, individual conversations. So yeah, Renjini's yeah. invited me you for the whole week. So when you have this, this uh, patty feel,